Yeah. Okay. Okay, today today is actually National Skilled Trades Day, which falls on oh. the first of first Wednesday of May. This is the second event. It started by a company in Youngstown, Ohio, actually. And I'm glad to say I caught that at the end since my nonprofit focuses majorly on skilled trades. So Anthony, Anthony Winston the third, PE, is a licensed engin electrical engineering consultant. And his firm is Winston en Engineering, which provides HVAC, electrical and plumbing engineering for commercial buildings, residential buildings, government, and education. So, Anthony, please break down, give us a little bit about what you have going on, and give us a breakdown about you. Um, well, right now, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, the wild, wild west, if you will, with us not really knowing what's going on due to this, this pandemic. Um, I've talked to a lot of my peers, and, you know, everybody's kind of just gritting their, their teeth and kind of waiting to see what, what's going to happen. So, um, shout out to everybody who's, you know, dealing with this on a, on a personal level, on a, on a professional level especially our first responders and, and folks like that. Um, but a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Chicago. I uh, grew up on the South side, um, spent the first 14 years of my life there. And then I, I moved to Arizona. Uh, mom's was in a kind of a, a bad relationship. So one day she was like, we're moving to Arizona. And the next day we were out on the plane and I was in Arizona. So I uh, finished out ninth grade there uh, and then finished high school in Southern California in uh, Moreno Valley. Went back to Arizona State. Um, that's that's kind of where I kind of discovered my path, if you will. Um, I joined my frat. Shout out to, to, to my brothers in Sigma. But um, I started out in electrical engineering. Originally, I wanted to be a network administrator just because it sounded cool. Um, and then after I found out what they actually do, I looked at a list of all the disciplines in engineering and saw electrical make the most money. So that's what I picked. Um, and then I had a, a professor who said, you know what, a lot of folks in the power side of things working for utilities, the engineers are, are aging out, so they're retiring. You should look at this. So I did and uh, got my degree. My degree is actually a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering with emphasis in power transmission and distribution. Uh, so essentially I learned how power is created and how it gets to your socket, that whole path. Um, and then out of school, I thought I'd be working for a utility, but that didn't happen. So I ended up working for Raytheon uh, in missile defense in the Boston area. What is and Raytheon? One day I, I'm sorry? What was it, Raytheon? Raytheon, that's correct. Okay, what is Ra Raytheon? What, what industry is that? So Raytheon is, is mostly in defense. Uh, their claim to fame initially was that they created the microwave. Okay. Yeah, um, we got some layman. We need to. You got to break that down into some layman terms for us, okay? <laughs> right. So uh, it's funny. I'm kind of. I'm really glad I'm out of that business because, you know, you're happy to get a job initially out of school. You're a fresh face engineer, but then you start realizing, yeah, this is missile defense, but these weapons can actually kill people. Um, Stick. I've been in situations where, I've been around warheads, right? Um, which, is pretty dangerous. And so just, just the need to want to wanna get out of that industry and move back west, I got out of that. Um, but one, one day at work, I got the financial perspectives on what the company made, and it was like some, you know, billions of dollars. And I kind of stood up in my cubicle farm and was like, you know what, I can do this for my, myself one day. And from that moment, I think it was like 2007, I was like, I'm going to start my own company. I don't know how, but I want to do my own thing. So... Uh, Eventually, two and two and a half years later, I moved back to California and worked for a company called Helix. I'm sorry, um, General Atomics, um, and they worked with the military as well. But it was more for uh, a program called EMOS and AAG. So on battleships, uh, the the devices that shoot off the jets and catch the jets in the middle of the water, the battleships, uh, that they use steam power to do that. And now General Atomics created a system that was all electric. It was all you know, magnets, and it was it was a pretty cool 
system. So I was the one testing a lot of those components. Um, and then eventually I started becoming a test director for different programs and mining motors. It got, you know, some really interesting stuff, but I realized I wanted to get do consulting. And in order to be an engineering consultant, you have to have that, that PE license. So once I got my license, I knew I couldn't use it at General Atomic, so I took a pay cut and left and worked for Helix Electric, which is a big um, electrical contractor. And my first project was downtown LA at the uh, federal courthouse. So I was bugging the electricians in the field. You know, I'm sure they got tired of me, but I, I wanted to learn and I was hungry. So um, I learned how, how to do drawings, which are much simpler than what I was used to in government defense. Um, and on that train ride, I, I took an extra laptop and I started Winston Engineering. And you know, five years later, we're still we're still running. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So that kind of that's that's basically a um, great intro. Congratulations on five <laughs> years. Right now, Thank we you. know it's a big. Uh, you know, a lot of companies aren't lucky enough to even say they've made it to five years. Yeah. So kudos to that and congratulations again so okay, i want to get into these questions and you wrote written a couple articles one article that you know took my my it, it captured me was in that how i escaped my nine to five holding on to a good job for the fear of the unknown is a mantra of the generation before me explain that to us because I, I, I 100% uh, agree. I, I, I love that that just drew me in. Tell, break that one down. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, as a mind, as you know, an African-American, uh, our folks clearly have gone through a lot of struggles. I mean, we could do a whole podcast, multiple podcasts on just that. But the whole thing of getting something and holding on to it because you never know how long you're going to have it, right? And, that's that's kind of the mentality that we've been forced to have um, due to the system of oppression and racism and, and, and the whole nine. So once you have a really good job, you always try to hold on to it because you just never know. So w once I I started telling some folks that I was looking to quit my, my really good paying job to start a company, I would get, are you sure you want to do that? And not, not in a discouraging way, just like you, you got something good, you sure you want to do that? Um, but I, I, you know, I, I can, I always bet on myself and, you know, my wife supported me and I just made that jump. So I think this gen, my generation, um, is kind of breaking free of that. You, you're seeing a lot more younger entrepreneurs now, um, because folks, because of the sacrifices that, you know, previous generations have made which generation are you? to actually take that freedom. Which generation are you? I'm, I'm a, a millennial. I'm born in, in 84, so I'm right in the beginning of the whole millennial stage. Okay. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to let them know which which area you were in. You can continue because you were going. You were flowing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's. I definitely appreciate all the, the hard work that, you know, my mom, my, you know, my grandparents. You know, my grandfather worked for the, uh, the telephone company for, gosh, I want to say 30-something years. I mean, he had stories working on the south side of Chicago. He told me one time he had to do go to uh, Elijah Muhammad's uh, okay. mosque on the south side of Chicago in the 70s. I believe it was the 60s or 70s. I cannot remember. But he told me he, he was in, like, their little atrium, and you have the Fruit of Islam, which is like, kind of like the, the guys in the suits, watching him as he's going through the entire building fixing stuff. So, um, yeah, shout out to my grandfather for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Shout out to that. I mean, shout out to all the essential workers. I mean, like, like I said, those are skilled trades. I mean, without yeah. them, and, I mean, no, and nobody could look, you can't look down on those type of people because they keep everything going. Exactly. I'm, exactly. I think I saw something, a little headline that said, you know, you were complaining about us asking for minimum wage. Now we're the ones that's keeping this country together. Exactly. Exactly. I like that. That was great. That was a great answer on that. Um, so, okay. So you, like you said, you're in that, you're at that cusp of the millennials, Gen Xers right there. 
what is your standing on social media now and how it affects everything basically but not let's just affect everything let's just start focusing on your business your industry the construction industry and, and engineering um it's it's tough right because when i when i first started the company i immediately started social media um accounts and there aren't many um MEP engineering firms with social media, and if they do, it's very, it's very generic. It's not anything that's going to capture you. And my my thought was, how can I make engineering interesting? Um, for one, that people will listen, and two, maybe it'll get me some business. Um, so it's been really instrumental. I've gotten business off Instagram. I've gotten business, a lot of business off LinkedIn. So um, just kind of tapping into your your industry. Don't necessarily worry about the followers so much it's about quality not necessarily quantity and i learned that from my follow gary v um, a lot and that's something he, he speaks on like it doesn't make sense for me to have a million followers if 200 of you are actually in the construction industry right oh uh, yeah i'm a big fan of gary v i mean like i said like when I, we've had our previous conversations, I'm like, I'm just straightforward, blunt. I mean, there's no sugar coating it. I mean, sometimes you just have to get to the point, let it be known. Social media followings, yes. Yeah, if you're not engaging with them, it makes no sense to have, like you said, two million followers if only 200 of them are like, oh, okay, hey, how you doing? But never reaching out. Yeah. So. And that's that's one thing I like about LinkedIn. Um, probably maybe once a month, I'll get, you know, somebody who is it, nine times out of 10, it's a, it's a black male, young black male who will reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, your inspiration, I see you doing it. This is something I want to do too. And it's like, cool. And I immediately say, if you need anything, just message me or whatever. And, and you know, cause my goal is to, to keep them from jumping over the same, through the same hurdles that I went through. If I can give them a little, you know, a couple little tips to make things a bit smoother than, than so be it. Okay, so you're big you're a fan of Gary V, like I said I am. Gary V is big on LinkedIn and Gary V is also mm -hmm. humongous on TikTok. Do you do any social media on TikTok as of now? <laughs> I tried TikTok in the beginning stages and it was I felt like the the older person who couldn't, you know, figure it out like the people who are always in their screen like that all super close. Um, it, to me, I, I didn't see the value for engineering. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I just, I didn't see it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get, I totally get that. But, and see, that's where, like, now I've noticed it. It's, like, done a whole 63, 60 before. Because, like you said, when you were probably doing it, it was before the whole celebrity rage and all of that. But I'm going to give you a tidbit, a secret, secret antidote. Your content is relevant. Believe that on TikTok. Really? 60 seconds. You can spew 60 seconds of content and just say what you feel and have it relevant. Hey, and it can transform across different platforms. You know, the attention span of people is how long? Not long at all. <laughs> it's like seconds or something like that. Right, less than that. Right. So you got shorter social media like Queeby is that new social media like the new netflix of for your cell phone where there's 10 minute clips nothing is longer than 10 minutes in movies form but they have part ones mm -hmm. part twos and things like that i've seen trademark attorneys blow up on TikTok for trademark law really? just breaking it down it's making it as an informational source for their people for just random people it is just coming across the screen and you're like oh i never thought of that I reached out to people on TikTok to like like I said trade right and um copy copy um right infringements and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Lawyers for I mean just hearing the information from someone, you know, in that demographic, I mean in that age group or whatever, somebody you can see is telling you like I'm not going to tell you any falsehood and ruin my reputation as a lawyer either. I'm going to give you the yeah. Stone Cold fact, like Gary Vee has spit out 60 seconds worth of knowledge for you, for his industry, for his niche. You're in, you say engineering, you know, African-American boys or your, your, your fraternity brothers, you know, 
and you focus it on that tag and they're just sharing your content for just the relevancy. So TikTok's yeah, changed okay. over a little bit. I mean, because I didn't get to see it and I'm like, last week I had a half a million views of my content. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, on accident. Like, I mean, I don't put no effort in. My, my content's all over, so, because I'm just getting a demographic up to, so I can feed to those kids that will know my hashtag from years to come. When they get to 18, 19, mm -hmm. they'll be like, that's the one that's always talking about trades, or that's you know so it, i mean and then once you yeah. get to a certain certain aspect like i said it transforms across pages like i was on a um podcast last night with john hope bryant and um dr george frazier they had a, po a power podcast last night which was fantastic and i streamed it on tiktok because i mean my following is so large where i can stream net live media from my from either one of their live streams directly to my TikTok stream, which doesn't record, but there are adults, there are truck drivers, there are millions of entrepreneurs, this real life people having fun, where it's just like not, it's not like Facebook, where you got to comment and do mm -hmm. all of that stuff. It's just like generic. Okay, here's a video. Let's take it as that. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna make put that on my on my board. Uh... Yeah, just, just, just look into that. It's it's, it's interesting. I mean, even if you just go in as an anonymous, check your boy tag Gary V and just look at some of his content. It's like, just do it. What are you waiting on? You know, <laughs> grown ups are here now. Celebrities are here now. It's like, okay, sorry. Let me get back to our our. our uh, <laughs> I get off in the TikTok sometimes. They don't pay me, but it's it's like it's such a great media source. It's like. I make a 60 second video and like one push, I'm sending it to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, my link, my email, with one push of the button. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, so okay. it's a, to go to every, nobody's competing with anybody. So it's like, you want to put it in the story? You want to put it in this? I said, the kids, the kids teach us a lot of different stuff. Like, it's really, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty funny. So, okay. You know what? I'm about to put this on my board right now. You need to. That's what I'm about to tell you. I mean, <laughs> hey, that's one of them things called the uh the bar bartering. <laughs> I'm giving you some good good <laughs> some good juice right here. Because you seem like, I mean, why not? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, let's get back. Okay, what kind of we went to backgrounds. Uh, so what fraternity were you with? I'm sorry. Your fraternity. Phi Beta Sigma. Okay. All right. Yeah, I joined uh, spring 2003. Um, just hit 17 years, so now they consider me an old head. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> and it was just you and your mom? When you were growing up, you don't have any siblings or anything? So actually, I have, um, uh, with my mom, I have a little sister, and then my dad, um, I have two two younger brothers, um, but for the most part, it's you know the, the folks who've had a a serious impact and you know were there for me all the time would definitely be my mom, uh, grandparents. Uh, my actually my grandma just passed away, but you know my grandfather's still here. I'm sorry. About and that. my um, yeah my my great grandmother she passed away some years ago, but um, there was always just like a, a really big support system around me. Um, that, you know, always kept me out of trouble. I remember, you know, my, my grandmother uh, in 52nd and Morgan, one of the roughest neighborhoods, she would, it, I would think I was 11 by the time she let me off the front stoop um, to go play with the other kids. So um, just a lot of good people who were in my corner uh, that were always there for me. Oh, that's fantastic. So it was like that temptation was right outside your window, but that didn't deter, deter you on the focus that you had going forward. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Absolutely. And I've, I've always had a kind of a, I've always had that internal drive to want to excel at whatever I've done, but, or want to do. But, you know, my mom, she's, you know, she was always pushing on me. If I got a B, it was a problem. Yeah, I understand that. And you have two daughters, you said, correct? I do, uh, four and a five year old, correct. Okay, so that was back to back, all right. <laughs> yeah, me and my wife, we, we wanted to, to get them in and out. And 
All right. So I had I, I had sent you a you know a list of questions and you know like I said my my whole brand is she get it done. It's all about she get it done and beating the odds and she don't just mean to just female or anything. It's just it's it's tough. <laughs> Period. Yeah. So. If your daughter, I mean, do you have any expectations or anything like? What if your daughter wanted to just be a journeyman and um, construct a journeyman plumber, for example? How would you? How I mean, would I'm you all for it. it. I'm for whatever drives you, because um, at the end of the day, it's your life. You're the one that has to live it. Um, we're we're all about planning. You come to me with an idea of something you want to do. Cool, let's start writing down the steps to get you to where you're going to be. But I'm also going to let you know, all right, depending on the type of life you want to live, this is how much money you're going to make. And, you know, teach them about bills and mortgages and all that stuff. Because if you come to me and say, hey, Dad, I want to be, I want to major in political science, but I have no idea where I want to go with it, we're going to, we're going to start talking about return on the investment, right? Because I'm going to pay for, we're going to pay for our kids to go to college. I had a lot of student loan debt. Luckily, I was able to get out of it. Um, but I don't want my kids to have student loan debt. So we're going to sit and say, hey, you want to go to this school? It's $30,000 a year. How is that going to line up with what you're doing once you get out of school, right? So um, I think I apply a business mindset to what, what it is that they want to do in their career so that they can better plan. But what if they said they didn't want to go to college? That's oh, not fine. That's we not just, their, their road. That they will just figure out what it is that you're actually interested in. Um, but you won't be living at home just living off mom and dad. <laughs> you're going to be doing something. Um, whether you, let's say, go to a community college for a couple of years to figure out maybe you don't want to do school because it's free here for two, the first two years. Or you just kind of dibble and dabble in certain things. Maybe you want to look at being an electrician. Like my older daughter, she's five, but I got her in, an electrical uh, circuit board set, right? She's taking an interest to that. That doesn't necessarily mean she needs to be, she wants to be an engineer. Maybe she wants to be an electrician or a lineman working for a utility or something like that. So um, nothing is really off the table in terms of career paths. Okay, I got a question. So how would you separate just teaching kids the difference between being an electrician and being an engine, electrical engineer? Uh, you're saying how I would explain to them how it's different? You know, yeah, because I mean, you're talking to a five, six-year-old. I mean, it's so quick, so easy to <laughs> <laughs> cross over. Electrician, which is, you know, a trade, <laughs> and electrical engineer, which is, you know, a lot of schooling. <laughs> um, it's, Right now, it's a bit too early. Um, my girls know that I'm an engineer. They think I build houses. Um, and I have to tell them, like, no, baby, I, I, you know, we design certain things in the house so that someone else can build it. So as they get older, I'll keep giving them more and more games so I can kind of figure out the path that they want to go, if they want to go that path. Yeah, that was just me leading into that next question of what actually does your firm do and what does MEP mean? So MEP stands for uh, Mechanical Electrical and Plumbing. Um, mechanical is, is that deals with HVAC, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And essentially, what we spit out uh, engineering permit plans so that residential and commercial buildings can be built or renovated. So, let's say you have a custom home you want to build, you have an architect who will design it in AutoCAD or whatever program. They give it to us, and we overlay our components. So, for example, HVAC, you have to do all the types of calculations to determine how big your HVAC system is how many ducts you need, um, how large the ducts are, the routings. Um, same with plumbing, depending on how many sinks you have and how many toilets. You have to do all these calculations to determine the proper pipe size and proper routing. Um, and electrical, you know, depending on the loads you have. If you, you know, houses always have lights, outlets, things like that. But it, you know, start throwing in electric vehicle chargers and solar systems. So we, we essentially size the system properly so that it's safe. Um, and that somebody can actually take a drawing, go you know out and actually build it. So we create construction drawing. Okay, okay. And do you um and that in involves you have a design team as well? 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm a licensed electrical engineer. I have a junior electrical engineer who's not licensed. He's actually um, studying to get his, to finish the first exam. Um, and then I have a, another mechanical engineer um, who will be taking his, well, he was supposed to actually take his exam last month, but the whole COVID thing took off. Um, and then we have, um, we have a partner who uh, reviews and, sh and stamps his and checks his work. And then I have an office manager. She takes care of, you know, I, it's funny we say office manager, but we don't have a physical office. But she, you know, answered the phone, um, did, kind of deals with the client's um, proposals and contracts and things like that. So uh, we have a pretty solid team. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So how did you recruit and how do you rec retain your staff? Um, recruiting has been different for every one of my staff members. There's no, there's no real set method to it. Your HR, your um, everything, right? I forgot about that. I forgot you're, you're, <laughs> you're that one. <laughs> well, no, actually we, our HR and payroll is a third party company. So okay. uh, we don't have it in the house, but we have somebody else takes care of it. But in terms of the hiring, um, initially, you know, I get recruiters who send me folks. But my, my first hire was Nick, my junior mechanical, I'm sorry, electrical engineer. He's a Purple Heart, a vet. And he came to me and said, hey, do you have any internships? Because he's still in school. And I said, you know what? No, but if you learn this program, come back and talk to me. And sure enough, two weeks later, he learned it. He came back and I gave him a test and I said, you know what? You're hired. So he was a huge help. And I said, once you graduate from school, I'll give you a job. And I think two years, year and a half, two years later, he graduated and he has a full-time position. Um, and then my mechanical engineer, I had one previously. It was a really bad hire and that was my fault because I, I didn't vet him properly. And when I say vet, I don't necessarily mean just run a background check. Like you really have to sit down with people um, and get to know what their, their aspirations, their goals, their dreams, what they like, what they don't like. Um, because you're, you're entering into a new relationship. So I, the next time around, I actually did that. And, and, and John, my mechanical engineer, he's, he's really solid. Um, and then my, my office manager, that's the first time I did hiring by myself. I put out an ad online and I held interviews at like a, um, it's called co-working connection. It's like a, uh, like a WeWork office, shared office type thing. Okay. And I had a, a ton of folks come in and interview and, um, yeah, she came in and I had never seen someone come in with the job description and wrote out exactly examples of how they meet that. And I just thought that was so impressive because nobody's done it. I've never even done it. Well, hold on. Repeat and, what you um, said she did. <laughs> so, you know how you have a job description and you have the bullet points of what the role will be. Okay. She typed it all out and under each bullet section she wrote out exact examples of how she's done that before in the past and so it was it just made things very easy so um yeah I, I, uh, if we expand and hire more folks i think i can take these lessons learned and apply it to getting more quality folks oh yeah that's that was some good tea right there i mean that i've never i've never heard of that <laughs> All right, so I mean, basically, you kind of answered your background. What, what, so what educational background do you need to be a part to have to be a part of the Winston Engineering team? And not well, necessarily, if it, if you, oh, not necessarily just what you're doing right now. I mean, like you said, I know you're venturing off into different projects, also. I mean, but what would be the core thing, like you said, you're looking for in a, in some in your team, your team members? So it it, it can kind of be all over the place. If you're somebody who's fresh faced out of college, I'm looking for someone with the ability to learn and adapt quickly. Um, because in this, in this industry, every project is different. Every client is different. Some clients can be jerks. Some clients can be really cool. So you, you really have to be able to interact with people and you have to be able to manage your own time because we work remotely as of now. So there's nobody coming by tapping you on the shoulder like, Hey, where's your, Know, where's your project we give you deadlines and we expect you to meet them um, I'm not somebody that's going to hoard over you I don't care if you go whatever go to Home Depot whatever it is your kids recital just as long as we get our you know our work done so um, you really have to be independent 
because not everybody can work remotely. It's not for everybody. And what kind of, like you, so the educational background for your, uh, what's the schooling background for your key people? So in order to, to get to a point where you're a licensed engineer, you have to have a four-year degree, and then you take what's called the EIT, which is um, the engineering, uh, fundamentals, fundamentals of engineering, so it's the FE exam. And that's an eight-hour exam. <laughs> Once you take that, you now consider an EIT, an engineer in training. While you're in EIT, you have to work under another engineer, licensed engineer, for a certain amount of time. And then you take another exam specific to what it is that you want to do, whether you want to be a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer. So me personally, I can take the mechanical engineering portion and become licensed. Um, but I just have to learn all that. Um, and then once you get your PE license, then you're able to consult. So it's kind of a, a long, a somewhat long road. It's not like as long as a doctor where you have to go to four years of undergrad, four years of medical school. And then eight years of residency, I think it is. Okay, wow. Um, but it is, it's it's pretty involved. Okay, okay. So, um, let me see. I know I highlighted another another article you, you have, The Crust, five years in business, where you said mm -hmm. people used to ask you to do some unscrupulous things, you know. <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, off just off the mark, not necessarily unscrupulous, but... You know, you've worked hard at getting to the level that you've gotten to. Do you see that someone would ask another electric, I mean, another contractor, I mean, an engineering firm, to do the thing that they were asked you to do, or is that just all across the yeah. board in construction? I think that 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 has crossed my mind. For someone to ask you certain things, they like they've had to have done it in the past. Um, and it's unfortunate that I hope that that engineer didn't didn't do it because we have a certain code of ethics uh, that we have to abide by. And number one, well, number one thing you learn is that public safety is always number one above anything else, which is why we have a stamp, right? Why drawing has to be stamped. Yes. Um, it's no different than a doctor who fills out a prescription for somebody because you're dealing with somebody's health. But yeah, I've had a client they wanted to build this huge warehouse. And I told them, I said, hey, for what it is that you want to do in this building, you need, I think it was like two, a 1,600 amp service. He wanted me to fudge the numbers so that he can stay below that to keep his existing equipment. Um, and that can be dangerous. And most recently, I had a client, uh, my guy Nick, he went out to the field to survey the site. And it was a dilapidated old historical building and the basement you Nick said you literally couldn't see the floor because there was so much trash and just disgusting stuff on the floor um, it looked like you know maybe someone had been living in there um, who knows if it you know I think he said hypodermic needles in there and it was dark no light and the client was trying to pressure him to go into the into this area and I told Nick I said no you guys will not um, sacrifice your safety for anything hmm. and I had to tell the client like look that's that's not how we operate I'm willing to lose out on a contract if that means that I'm, I'm making sure that my team is safe and that we're doing things that abide by you know regulation okay okay well, give me some um, challenge you, challenges you've faced as a minority business owner um Luckily, I haven't had anything overt happen. Well, that's good. Great. Right, let's um, stop changing the conversation. That's great. To, and I, <laughs> we don't always have to have something negative. Now do we? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but I've had a couple instances where I've met a client, and they're kind of looking me up and down like, like I don't belong there. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I actually did a post about this a while ago on Instagram. You have to act like you belong there, no matter who's in the room. Um, it. And quite often, you know, I'm the youngest person in the room. I'm the only black person in the room. So I, I try not to read into it too much unless somebody gives me a reason to. So that's the same as being, uh, you're in the room and 
I'm not sure the, the the racial the markup of your your staff, but if you're in a meeting where they go to the, uh, the your assistant that may be of another color as he's the owner, he's Anthony Winston the <laughs> third. <laughs> yeah, I'm do, I'm working on the, on a personal project of mine, and I have a developer. You know, he's an older white guy, um, very cool, very knowledgeable guy. But we went to a city meeting, and everybody was looking at him to answer questions. <laughs> and I, you know, I just I don't necessarily have to assert my who I am. I'm just sitting there like, okay, and I step in when I need to. But uh, you know, I'm I'm secure in myself that I don't necessarily have to be the big dog in the room making a lot of noise. Yeah, I see. I, I, I get that a, a whole lot. When my na- I have a male's name, and they just think that the person with me is yeah. my business, and she get it done. It's like, yeah, just a way to confuse the whole party. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, I mean, yeah, that's good. I mean, we don't have to have always face challenges, as a, you know, but since that's good. So, what have you done to avoid do you think you've done something, you know, is there a characteristic about yourself that you make sure you stand up in an assertiveness of, you know, a way that you walk so, you know, people don't look I at you like that? Confidence is a huge thing, but I can't, I can't say that I've done anything to avoid issues based on me being a minority. Um... I can't help the way someone was brought up or what they believe in or don't believe in or whatever the case may be. I just walk in this, I just walk through the world like, like I'm not afraid. I walk through the world, um, seeing it as, you know, like cliche, the world is your oyster. Um, I, I don't think there's anything that I can't do or find the right people that, that, you know, that can do it. So, that's good. Uh, I, you know, I know, I know that there are systems in place to do certain things to keep you, you know, as a minority from doing what you need to do. Um, I'm not saying that I ignore it. I think I'm educated enough to recognize it if it does come across. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that. I, I, uh, my, I mean, my daughters, they probably don't remember, but they've dealt with it. We were in Palm Springs once. And me and my wife and my, my kids were both in strollers at the time. And this guy is behind us on his cell phone. And he's like, you know, you got all these, all these N-words walking around here. And we turn around. And he just keeps walking. And he says it pretty loud. And I know my daughter's heard it. But you can't escape it. Yeah, you can't. I mean, it's just, I mean, I was just curious because I was just equating the fact that this, the, the the territories or the areas you said that you you lived in you know seem to be pretty diverse that ta- that takes a big toll in my opinion on your I mean you you know how you look at things if you were raised in you know like a North Carolina town where there was not a population of people that look like you around versus like you said you lived in Chicago you I think, I mean, just this is just my opinion that, you know, when you're around different groups of people growing up, it's easier for you to grad, gravitate around, you know, avoiding and not really listening to the noise of what those other people have to say. It's like, I've been that only dot in the uh, room. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, so where I live and where I work out of, it's it's a predominantly white area. Um, when me and my wife were looking for our current house, um, I think there's one other black family up here. And my wife looks at me and she's like, you you sure you want to do this? I was like, well, somebody has to. (laughs) Um, I, you know, I'm not going to let diversity keep me from doing certain things. I definitely want to make sure that I, I, I'm a part of diversity efforts so that my kids can understand who they are, right? Because they're of mixed race. My wife is black and Mexican, so I want them to understand who they are. And if you go into their their playroom, they have a bookshelf. They have a ton of books just on people of color, women, especially women of color, um, because I want them to to know that it's normal 
to see somebody with kinky hair in a book, I think that's that's a huge deal, um, especially for little girls. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah, I just did something. I seen a, put a uh, a coloring book on like out on my TikTok and my website and my LinkedIn. It's just like ten pages of you know kids. Hey, print this out and give it to your kids so they can color in what they think the construction worker's supposed to look like or let them have fun with it, color in the tools or, you know, some kids come home and they recognize that stuff. Like you said, you come home with a safety vest on, your kids are looking at that safety vest like, okay, hold on, that's different than daddy got a suit on or his polo and, you know, some work boots. He went to a job site today or something like that. It's good to see those type of things. Um, okay, so you, uh, you highlighted, you see, I did my background, I did some background research on my people when I'm trying to check them out. <laughs> you did an article, I mean, you, uh, you highlighted an article, which, you know, I've been, read this, um, some articles in this, uh, magazine, Electrical Contractor, RIP uh-huh. Your Business, said, which is essentially a letter to write, why do you think your business will fail? Mm-hmm. Okay, and you did this like right pre, I mean, this was like, this came out, I mean, this was like right pre-corona, you know what I mean? So how yeah. you think that, how do you think that uh, article resonates now? Honestly, I think it's, um, I don't want to say it's irrelevant, unless, it's kind of hindsight, right? So if you That's make it, <laughs> <laughs> it's tough because if, 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 you know, the businesses that make it out of this, they can then now plan for the next pandemic because they know what they need to do to survive. So then at that point, once you've made it, then you can write that letter to yourself as to why you didn't make it. So, you know, I've, I guess I've been kind of lucky because in 2008, I was with Raytheon for a year at that point. Um, I didn't have much in retirement. I didn't have any real estate. Um, It was government work, so I still had a job. So I didn't see personally that affect me so much, but I paid attention, just like I'm paying attention now. So um, I think going through that is equipping me with the ability to survive, whether it's a recession or pandemics, which caused the recession or whatever the case may be. So. Yeah, it's a, that is kind of eerie that that popped, that I, I put that out when I did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought about it because it resonated too, but like 08, I'm like, yeah, in 08, if what's happening now, me as the black woman in this industry, I wouldn't have been able to survive. So it's like 2008 taught me so much to prepare that at any given time everything can go to hell in a handbag. I mean, if people weren't prepared, like I didn't have my 401k, wasn't all where it was cracked up to be. And that's when I was like, okay, well, you know, I do have some money. Let me buy a bunch of stocks and things like that now, back in 08, Mm -hmm. which granted me the wherewithal to be able to retire now at 41 because it was in a good position. And I got out the game right before this second wave of everything hit. Cause you know, like in January, yeah. everything went that's up awesome. like, okay. Okay. Well, see, I mean, that's, that's it's pretty funny. good. Go ahead, what you gonna when say? this thing hit, I think what was so surprising to me of so many of these big companies that can't survive not making money Payroll. Um, for a minimum, I uh, say of six months. Um, I two used to weeks. follow Susie Orman a lot. In two yeah. weeks. <laughs> two weeks, yeah. Um, Susie Orman would always say, try to have six months to a year of, of you know, savings for things to happen. So I would have thought that big companies would, would do the same. And, you know, it, it's crazy what the state this country is in. Somebody said that the United States is like a broke person who likes to wear a Gucci belt. Um it just the mentality is just it's wild i am so sad to say and i'm so sad to equate just how you just said that i equate like america ain't nothing but the uh projects i equate america to the projects i mean you see everybody in the projects trying to live like the celebrities that 
you know, a broke mindset. I heard today, you know, if you, you know, you, you look broke, you got money. If you, you look like you got money, you don't got no money. It's like the total opposite of what they're reach, what we're reaching for. Yeah, sad yeah, to say. Yeah, and I, I think with that, I mean, I you know, I went to school, when I went to school in Chicago. Um, I knew a lot of folks who, um, you know, I would envy them because they had all the the flyest, flyest gear, the nicest Jordans. And it wasn't until I got older that I understood the psycho the, the psychology of it, right? Yes. It's, the it's slavery. one of those things where you equate that stuff to a certain level of success. And if you're in a bad situation, um, you want to you, you want to take yourself out of it. And if getting a pair of Jordans momentarily takes you out of that, that mindset of I'm broke, I don't have much, um, then I get it. It's just now we have to, to flip that to, to understand where our values lie. Yeah, but we're adults now, and that was teenagers and kids, and mommy or daddy probably was buying, or you had to do something scrupulous <laughs> to get it. <laughs> but now you're adults, and if you want a, um, a, 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 a Land Rover, because, oh, I'm pissed off right now because, you know, you know, maybe me buying a Land Rover is going to make me feel okay for a couple minutes, but then you get COVID, and you got a Land Rover payment. Because you living upside to me. Them Jordans you gotta pay for up front. <laughs> Ain't no payday yeah. loan on the Jordans. But just like houses, you know, if you see that big picture, America's the best. They've been telling us America's great. Compared to what? I mean it's Yeah. Hey, it opens your eyes up a real a whole lot. Alright, let me see. Uh I just been enlightening. <laughs> I'm not missing anything, am I? Uh, so far, no. Keep it coming. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so if you could do one thing over again in your life, what would that be? Oh. <laughs> let's go. Let's do it. Break it down. Let's go personal and business. Personally, I think I would have uh, tried to pursue sports harder than I did. Um, you know, I did pretty well in high school in basketball. And, you know, I had some really small, like, Division three schools looking at me. But I was like, you know what? I want to go to Arizona State. At the time, you know, they're still obviously D1. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll walk on the team. And I get to, to college, and I meet one of, one of my, my buddies, Robbie. We're still friends to this day. And uh, we were going to walk on the team together. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I can do both. And he actually, he made the team. Um, but, I, you know, every March Madness, I'm like, man, that's one of them woulda, shoulda, couldas, but it is what it is. I, I can't be too mad. Um, in terms of the, the business side of things, I think I would have given up control sooner. And what I mean by that is, like, hiring my office manager. It was so, so, so many nights I stayed up late because I was trying to do things myself. Um, and you, you get so concerned about how much it's going to cost you as opposed to seeing the value on the other side. Um, that's really about it. I don't, I, don't, I don't really harp on the past because the past is what got you to where you are right now. Man, yeah, I mean, that's, that's deep. That is pretty deep. Um, let me see. I think, I mean, I've like, you knocked out damn near everything. <laughs> um, so, your mentors, let's say, as the adult you are now, who are some of your mentors that you look, look, look at? Um, it's, it's funny, you, you kind of have mentors for different things. Um, like I, well, actually lucky. my neighbor. You're lucky because a lot of yeah. people can, don't have mentors. <laughs> They're begging and yeah. fighting. <laughs> yeah, one of my, um, my neighbor actually, and he's actually my commercial real estate agent. Um, he's an older gentleman. He was like a Dow executive and he's been in high up. And, um, just the game that he gives me is, 
And I don't even think he does it on purpose. He's just, he's a talker. And I'm just sitting there just like... Feeding it. You know what I mean? So I try to, you know, I pay attention to the, um, especially the older generation. The older I get, the more I listen. Um, like one, I love to call my grandfather and ask him about how things used to be. Um, because it gives you an insight, especially with him as a black man in Chicago in the 60s and 70s, right? It gives you a lot of insight into who he was and what the times were. Um, but then going back to, to mentorship, I have a, another mentor um, who actually helped me with business plans and things like that. So there are a lot of free resources like um, government-funded programs where you can find business mentors. Um, one is called SCORE, uh, S-C-O-R-E, I forget what it means. And then another one is uh, SBDC, that's a federal program, both of them are. So you can find folks that are in your arena that can um, to get you where you need to be. You just have to kind of reach out for those resources. So you got to basically close mouth, don't get fed type of uh, situation. Open your mouth and ask. They're not just going to come to you. Exactly. Yeah. I, I've never claimed to be the smartest person in, in the room, but I try to find those individuals who who can um, complement what I'm lacking. Okay, so you know, I almost forgot. This was a big question. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to wrap us up because we're doing good. We got a good good pace going on right now. <laughs> we're almost at an hour, and so I'm a networking guru. Okay, I love to network. Networking is like second nature to me. I walk in the room, I'll go talk to anybody. I mean, when I go in that room, I'm going. I'm looking for whoever thinks that they're the big dog. And walking up to them, like, okay, I mean, because what, what's the worst that they can say to me is no, right? Mm-hmm. Or I don't have time. Okay, well, guess what? I don't want your type of bit. I'm not going, you know, I wouldn't interrupt the conversation, but I'm going to graduate my way to be able to make that make that conversation or take that picture or get that little sideline. Yeah. What is your, what is your, what is your, what is your take on networking? Because I've seen that you... You say in one of your articles that networking is key. Um, initially, networking was uh, awkward for me. I've never, I'm, I'm naturally a shy person. I don't like a lot of attention drawn to me. I, I don't like public speaking, but I had to learn, right? So I think that's one of the big, the big takeaways or big things I've learned from being in college with one, my fraternity, and two, being a part of uh, NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers, is that when you get into leadership positions, you are forced to talk in front of people. You are forced to assert yourself. Um, not saying that it, it took away all of my, my fears, but it, it definitely helped me get over it. Um, but initially when I started the company, trying to sell yourself, is, it's very, it was very awkward to me. Um, it wasn't very natural. It was like, hey, my name's Anthony. This is what I do. But as time went on, I started just striking up conversations. And if it leads to business, so be it. If not, then that's fine, too. Um, because nine times out of ten, you may have the ability to help them with something that they need. Like, give them a resource. Like, they may need a contractor or whatever the case may be. Um, but I think networking is, is critical to any business. One of my buddies... Um, uh, Joe Tillman, he um, he's a, an investment banker. Uh, he was an attorney, and he told me every day you have to make it your 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 goal to meet a new person. And that that kind of stuck with me, and especially before this COVID, you know, before this COVID thing was happening, I was going to coffee shops or you know calling folks, reaching out on Instagram, whatever the case may be. I was trying to reach as many folks as I possibly could because you just never know. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah, like I said, networking is key. I mean, like I tell you, I, I, re- you reached out to me. I mean, and then I did a little post. I mean, I'm just like the the trickle effects of things that happen. And then yeah. I attended a a network a virtual networking event last night and did my thing. Put a little post on there. Then I wake up this morning like, did he just share my post? You know what I mean? I'm like. <laughs> Okay, I'm like, okay, I'm liking that. I'm like, so one of the best entrepreneurial networkers in the country that's up, that looks like us, you know what I'm saying, just shared my post to his network. 
I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, that works for me. But I would have never done that without reaching out, without putting my two cents in or, like you said, networking. So has networking affected you in, um, during this COVID or are you still networking virtually or how's that going for you? Uh, virtually, I've been, I, and I think it's it's kind of helped because a lot of people are at home, so they're on their phones all the time. So LinkedIn has been very good to me. Um, it, it's it's been very helpful, and I've been able to, to pin people down um, to uh, to have conversations. Like I told you, I had a podcast interview uh, earlier today, and it was with the uh, uh, owner of a construction firm who I'd been following for a while, like. Um, to me, he's almost like a celebrity just from what he posts and the type of engagement that he gets. And I hit him up and was like, hey, I want to. can I be on your podcast? And he's like, sure. So who knows if this would have happened if he, you know, before coronavirus because he would have been much more busier. Right, yeah, because, I mean, that's, I was just at Con Expo um, in Vegas when corona was hitting, like where they were getting everybody out of, like, yeah, we're shutting down the 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 whole expo a day early and this and oh, that. Wow. So, I mean, you know that that only comes around every three years, and that's the largest construction equipment of gathering in North America, period. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was a uh, wow. that was a that was that was rough. Um, and I think that's that's a that's a big thing is that now the conferences. Various conferences around the the U.S. are going to be shut down, and those are great ways, especially the after hour stuff where you you know you kind of meet people in a social setting. So that's that's going to take a hit in terms of um, networking. Yeah, that is that is a that's a big one. But at the same time, you know what it is a plus that I've noticed. All of them are coming virtual. Like the ones I've been um, checking out, like with Dr. Frazier, like that Power Podcast was supposed to be in June. And he's now, I mean, he had Les Brown on there a couple days ago, Lisa Nichols. I mean, and you got all the big hitters because they're sitting at home too. <laughs> so he's yeah. just bringing it to the screen. So I'm getting all of this tea from all of these power players. Okay, so I could probably not afford to go to each one of you guys and you've had. 15 people, power players on this podcast, and you go for an hour every, what, it's Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, every Mm -hmm. week, you got three events with the biggest African-American power players in the industry from coming all over, yeah, that tea wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been able to get that tea, you know, go to those conferences, be able to sit right in front of you and put a comment in a box, and guess what? Somebody might get I me mean, engage with you, so I mean, yeah, it's been some true. interesting things. Point. Well, um, let me see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to finish this up with I got a couple more questions. And so, like you were saying with your guy, say you, just run it past me. You got 60 seconds. We are in the elevator. We are in the World Trade, the New World Trade Tower, and we're at the bottom, going all the way up to the top. You got 60 seconds to pitch to me what. Winston Engineering is all about. Not Anthony, but Winston Engineering. Promote your business. Sell me. Give me your sixty-second pitch. So Winston Engineering is an HVAC, electrical, and plumbing engineering um, firm. We provide engineering permit plans. Whether you're building a custom home, uh, whether you're building a Starbucks, all the way up to you know, hundred thousand square foot manufacturing facility. Uh, we essentially can take care of all your engineering permit need, permit drawing needs, um, no matter what the size of your project, uh, minus stadiums and hospitals, of course. Okay, okay. What do you see Winston Engineering doing in five years? Or no, not. Let me take that back. Let me take that back. You told me, I know, that you're, you're, you seem like you said you're a serial entrepreneur. You're, you're ready to get into the next projects. I mean, one conversation we had a couple of days ago. So, yeah. what do you want to do next? So, the goal is to, um, is to have Winston Engineering become a system in itself where I don't have to always be there. Um, 
I, I want it to, to, to run by itself, have individuals in place, and I check in and check out as needed. Um, but I have a couple other uh, business opportunities where I'm looking to build, you know, an indoor golf entertainment facility. Um, oh, I you know, love this, golf. <laughs> What you say? I said I love golf. We that's one a big thing here in Ohio. Like we don't have many because it gets winter time. Yeah. <laughs> so that indoor golf is fantastic. They're building a couple here now, but yeah. So I'm I'm trying to get into the entertainment side. Uh, I want to make people smile. Um, to be honest with you, um, I think that'll be great. And just brainstorming with a couple with one of my frat brothers. You know, he's a um, very intelligent, very capable, just awesome brother who we're trying to come up with some business opportunities to have multiple streams of income because at the end of the day, I don't want to have to work, right? I want to be able to work when I want and I want to spend my time serving other folks. Um, another big thing is that, you know, I want to get into the wine industry. I want to grow wine grapes and I see parlaying that into education, maybe having high school kids come to the, you know, come and see how winemaking process is because it's a huge industry. Um, and even with, the, you know, with the golf facility, why not bring in disadvantaged youth to teach them how to play golf? Exactly. Because otherwise they don't have um, the access to it because golf can be pretty expensive. Exactly. So everything I do, I want to do it to where it has a service component of it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was just, um, I was just, like I said, this corona has had me sitting in webinars and Zooms. I just attended a Zoom meeting with uh, Paul Brunson, and he was the, uh, what was it? He was the matchmaker back in the day. But now he, he he's phenomenal. And I posted on my website 56 ways, 56 ways to make um, extra income. So you might want to check that out on my website. She get it done. Do. 56 different ways. I mean, from branding, from um, network marketing, from, I mean, you name it. I mean, from just, like I said, where I told you on lives, like doing live stream, like I got an engagement on TikTok. Like they pay me when I live stream, people will throw coins here and there and it's like, okay. All right, you got some interesting oh, wow. content right there. Just like on YouTube, YouTube has a different window, but yeah, it's it was fifty six ways. I mean, I'm just gonna give you a couple. I'm gonna give you a little couple tea, couple little tidbits of tea. It was like from zero money, zero experience <laughs> to like a five hundred dollar investment. He was mm. talking about you know write a book. Record an audio only book. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I would have never thought of that. I talk a lot. I mean, you know, if you think about it, that's getting it to be the new wave of the future. That's all I do is audio books. Yeah, that's it. I mean, consulting, like you said. I mean, it's just like so many different curated events, you know, retreats and stuff like that. Now we're going to start little, little, st it, hey, check that. It, it's 56 ways. To make alternative income, it's pretty. I'll it's pretty dope. Down. But um, I think let's see. I mean, you got anything else? Let's get you got. Let's get you. you oh, I know. I got another question. PPE loans. Have you had any issues trying mm -hmm. to um try to reach out and try to get any anything with the PPE COVID loans? So yeah, uh, when when the first round of money came out, um, Bank of America. Um, luckily, I had a good relationship with the banker there, and, and I, I got up early in the morning because I knew it was going to hit. I just didn't know if it was like 8 a.m. California time or 8 a.m. East Eastern. Coast time. Uh, so he, he hit me at like 6 in the morning, like the link is live now. So I went and submitted everything, and then I didn't hear anything. And then on the news, they kept talking about how all these large companies are getting all this money, and then they said the money ran out. So I'm like, oh, great. So when this next round came out, they asked me for additional information and that whole, just uploading, uploading documents was a pain and it, it was, it was terrible. And actually day before yesterday, I got an email with the different statuses saying, Hey, your stuff has been submitted to the SBA. Hey, you now have an SBA number. 
And then yesterday they sent me an email saying, hey, sign your disclosures. And they said, your money will be in your account in one or two days. An hour after I signed the disclosure, the money was in the account. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a huge relief for us um, because I, I, when we get paid from clients or whatever, in my mind I'm thinking, all right, that's two months of, of, of payroll. That's three months of payroll um, because I want to make sure that, that my team is taken care of. Oh, well, that's fantastic. That, that's, hey, that's a good thing. Hey, that was a yeah. way, that's that's a that's a beautiful way to end the in end the conversation. <laughs> with great news, you know. Well, uh tell us anything else you want to leave off with. Um, I mean, we're just we're just doing our thing. One uh, you know, I put out to social media that we are offering our service services for free to a small business owner. Maybe you know, before this COVID thing hits, you were in the middle of a design process for an office building or your dream restaurant or whatever the case may be, um, and now you're, you can't continue. So we want to offer our services for free. Um, initially, I only opened it up to Wildemar and Marietta, California, but we're willing to open it up to other cities. Um, and I put it out a couple of weeks. We just haven't had anybody bite on it. Um, so I just, you know, I really want to help folks when we can. Okay, well, uh, tell everybody where we can um, reach you and find out any information that they want to, you know, reach out to you at. Um, so you can go to winstoneng.com. That's our, you know, our website. And find me on social media, Winston Engineering, on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can also search, you know, me personally, Anthony Winston Third on LinkedIn. And soon TikTok. Uh, I'm going to jump on just like you suggested it. That'll be fantastic. I mean, hey, little things count. You might as well. Well, yeah, it was fant absolutely. fantastic talking to you. Um, and we just going to wish you the greatest success. My dog was actually quiet for the whole time. So now he's like, <laughs> y'all been talking long enough. It's time to, time to move on.